Advancing Zombie, Apogee Goes Dimension 3, and magazines hit puberty. It's May 1996, and this is Yesterzine. In the 90s, video games had a growing up problem. If you want a half-hearted metaphor, the industry had reached the age where it was attempting to grow an unconvincing moustache and order beers without its voice squeak giving it away. This was a problem that also applied to the magazines. There were two types of people the early magazines were aimed at. The first is the absolute nerd hobbyist who'd happily spend three weeks typing in a game they'd play for three hours. See 1980s CVG, whose first issue described itself as the world's first fun computing magazine, something they backed up in the first five pages with an advert for a Commodore VIC-20. The advert highlights a bi-directional interface for a daisy wheel printer, the ultimate party accessory. The first editorial content is a promise the next issue will teach you how to solve a Rubik's Cube, and shortly after this, they're promoting a doorbell and a telephone answering machine. 90s old schoolers will recognise the company though. A decade later, you couldn't pick up a magazine without seeing 15 silica adverts. The issue devotes four pages to printing the code required to play a basic version of Space Invaders. This listing has to be typed into a NASCOM 2. The only way to own a NASCOM 2 was to buy it as a kit and hand solder several thousand joints. The other people the games magazines were aimed at were, not to put too fine a point on it, young kids. A good example of this was the magazine CVG became over the next decade. It was pure tween boy fodder. The mailbag being answered by a character called Yob, who claimed to have the biggest sack in town. The industry was different by the mid-90s. A lot of those Spectrum owners were university age. The PlayStation had drawn in a new late teens and early twenties crowd. Theoretically semi-normal adults wanted to read about video games, and there were a few attempts to appeal to this crowd. Edge is the one you'll know, mostly because it's outlived its direct rivals by half a decade and counting. There were more. Future's own arcade borrowed from the lifestyle magazines of the time, including all the things they thought the FHM readers they were targeting liked. The covers moved wildly from Lara Croft to South Park to any excuse to put a lady from a game on the cover to football. You people all like football, right? It sounded promising, but 1998 was possibly already too late to eight magazines that were themselves already on the decline. Arcade lasted a couple of years, but by the end had largely abandoned its faux lads mag exterior. The final covers looked like they could have adorned almost any games magazine. Future were clearly doubting the concept too. While issue 1 had kicked the door in and proclaimed itself the new face of video games, the last issues were making the bold claim of being the video game magazine. We're here for EMAP's entry though, and a couple of years before Arcade it took a different initial tactic to Future. Although in another instance of, it looks like Dudley plans these things, the tagline is strikingly familiar. Maximum was not reviews focused. The gigantic 165 page launch issue doesn't hand out a score until page 142. Unlike Dave Perry's Games World though, it doesn't then attempt to review several hundred games with four reviewers in a space smaller than Dave's ability to play Mario 64. The point of Maximum is in writing about games. When they call something an extended play they mean it. The Wipeout feature in issue 1 runs to 14 pages. We're not looking at issue 1 this month of course, we're looking at issue 6, and you certainly can't accuse them of going for the Glamour magazine cover. Here's a gaming confession. I am a giant wuss in virtual reality. My one properly irrational fear is basically anything in VR. I played a bit of the hardly realistic looking Jurassic Park VR game, and then, while I was hiding in a cupboard from a raptor, my cat attempted to climb my leg. I'm not sure either of us have recovered from the events of the next 10 seconds. I've had the demo of the VR mode of Resident Evil Village sat unplayed on my PSVR 2, 
pretty much since the launch of that system, because I've yet to work up that kind of courage. But it's why we chose this magazine, because I've realised something. I've never finished a Resident Evil. I've barely played Resident Evils. I probably did the very first part of the first game back in the day, but I've never even started the ones people think you should have played. I've never touched four, or seven. Conversely, at least I've not played five. Some people will have chuckled about that and I don't even really know why. So here's a chance to do Yesterzine the pure way. Our remit here when we look at games is me telling you if it's worth you playing these games today if you're coming to them for the first time. Well, this is going to be my first proper go. We know the dangers here, because even if you've not played Resident Evil's early entries, you've seen stiff wooden movement and preposterous camera angles. And that's just the intro. If it's been a while, I don't think you remember the acting. You might think you do, but you're not nearly thinking bad enough. The pre-title sequence is, if anything, a high. I'll tell you in advance. The story is, team went to investigate, team disappeared, we send in another team, scary things happen, helicopter buggers off, hide in a mansion. A classic. Alpha team is flying I mention that so you can devote your full attention to the sheer quality of the intro and production. We should be fair, Resident Evil being such the standout of the generation as it was, feels like it was very part of the new next generation world. But the PlayStation is in its first year in the UK. Even the first Tomb Raider is eight months away. Resi's cinematic presentation is a trailblazer. We're even still on the tail end of the brief fad for FMV games and it's not like they were all winners. They're also not all this. It was Bravo Team's helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most of the equipment was still there. However, we soon discovered why. And that's the thing about this intro. You can literally seek to any moment of it and encounter absolute gold. In fact, let me prove that. It does mean Resi is, no question, one of those times where the movie adaptation has better acting than the game. How could it not? The first clue is none of the cast wish to be identified. Those are all the character names. You get the choice of two of these to control. Chris is a brick shithouse, and Jill, the pro-choice, gets a lockpick, more items, and more gun. The smarter of you will have spotted this billing itself as the director's cut, and for our purposes, that's important. The director's cut came along 18 months after the original release, mostly to cover some horrific delays in the sequel's production. It gives us a few things. There's a new mode that changes the location of items and enemies for people doing a second playthrough. To make up for this, you get a shiny new gun with a chance to one-shot enemies, and crucially, a new wardrobe. A gaming trend Capcom were right at the front of. The other change is a beginner's mode, which makes the enemies less bullet spongy and gives you twice as much ammo. If you are, like me, coming to Resident Evil 1 for the first time, it strikes me this is the way to do it rather than spend the full 40 hours bashing your head against brick walls. I'll state I'm cheating slightly further too. This game is on the PlayStation Classic Mini and that's where I'm playing it. Crucially, this means that I have save states rather than the old school Resident Evil system of only being able to save when I come across a typewriter and have a ribbon for it. There is though still a system to prevent full save scumming, and the technical explanation of this is that you need to hit the reset button on the machine to get to the menu and it's all the way over there. The character you're not playing disappears somewhere just before you get inside the mansion. While we're discussing this, we overhear a gunshot and react to danger by immediately further splitting the party. Stay alert. I am absolutely sure leaving our commanding officer alone in the hallway is a good idea and will not come back to haunt us later. In the dining room, I get acquainted with the controls and yet yeah, they're pretty bad. 
If you understand the phrase, this is pure tank controls. If you don't, imagine micro machines. If they moved like they were driving through honey and turned slower than the old lady in front of you in the car park. What is this? We find some blood, which is apparently is confusing it? to our protagonists. And the man whose name I've already forgotten suggests we split up even more and sends Jill off to look for clues on her own while he does a professional forensic examination of something that took him 20 seconds to work out was blood. If this is Alpha Team, I'm beginning to think that what took out Bravo Team need have been no more fiendish than a door where it is ambiguous if you are supposed to push or pull. Jill near immediately makes a discovery that would be a lot more surprising if we weren't 20 odd Resident Evil games deep and zombies weren't more overplayed than that Mitchell and Webb sketch about the football. It's a zombie! We run away and let Man the Man Man, whose name I still don't remember, deal with the problem, which at least neatly keeps all the blood in one place. It's nice to keep a tidy cursed mansion. We decide to go tell Captain Wesker in the hall about the whole zombie issue, and oh look, he's disappeared. Who could ever have seen that coming? Ian, other character, orders us to search for him, but without leaving the hall, which at least explains why Wesker was the one in charge. After we do a lap of the staircase, he hands us a lockpick, and in a stunning example of learning basic lessons, dispatches us to go look in the rooms the other side of the hall while he returns to the dining room to spend some quality time with his blood collection. On second thoughts, I'm kind of glad he's not coming with us. He tells us if we need him to simply come back to the hall because he'll be there before immediately leaving the hall. Luckily, the next two rooms will cover us for demonstrating the other two major gameplay mechanics of these early Resi games. First, the puzzle room. After some looking around, I accidentally walk into some stairs, pushing them across the room. These turn out to be useful in another camera angle for retrieving what turns out to be a map of the ground floor, kept, like it is in all good homes, on top of a creepy statue. A chance to try out the other memorable mechanic occurs the other side of the door, as without warning, your mum's makeup artist crashes through the window and despite this being literally the iconic scene in Resident Evil, everyone knows, I'm still so surprised I forget the auto-aim button, try to do it manually, and fail dismally, taking 12 of my 15 shots to dispatch the dog, which proves an issue when another one tries the same trick around the corner and I try to kill him with the knife which fails, and I get dumped back to the title screen while realising how long it is since I saved. I know this game has auto-aim, but the control for it is not listed in the manual. That's fine, it says I can redefine them in the options menu, and that options menu can be accessed from the title screen. No, it bloody well can't. I even put my own ISO on the PS Classic in case someone had altered this release, but no, I'm 99% certain the option menu in this is a phantom. Thankfully what I do have is a walkthrough that tells me it's L1, and doing that allows me to dispatch both dogs in 8 shots, just over half my current capacity. Given every bullet hit, I am officially playing this game perfectly and there is nothing you can say otherwise. We'll enter spoiler territory if we go much further, but I'm liking this. It's like the missing link between the Path CGI games like The Seventh Guest, which at times feels like it's set in the same house and the proper 3D we'd reached by the likes of Resi 4. It's actually quite a short time in gaming history, and this feels like as good a way as any to experience it, especially with the at least minor quality of life improvements in this director's cut. There is a remake, first released on Cube, but which came to many, many other systems later. You could well choose to play that, but on this occasion I don't think I'm going to. The remakes of Resi 2 and 3 are so altered they might as well be different games, but that's not true of Remake. And if I'm going to be fighting most of the jank anyway, why not experience it at least relatively close to how it's meant to be played, door animations to hide loading and all. We return to the magazine, where to be clear that despite this article taking up pages 6 to 20, the first 15 editorial pages of the issue, this is not a review. The magazine was badged the May issue, and a quick glance back to the previous one reveals it hit shelves on the 27th of April. Resident Evil did not get a UK release until July, 
So bear in mind that throughout all of this, we're talking about a game that was nearly three months from being available to buy for UK gamers. So how do you go about writing 15 pages on a game you can't review yet? The answer, at least initially, is apparently fanfiction, as Maximin starts with what appears to be the conversation inside the helicopter at the start of the intro. It's not the script from the game. I can't find a record of it anywhere else, in fact. Maximin just decided to rewrite the intro for some reason. It takes up a full page, spilling into the next section. Useful information does at least follow. The remainder of those first two pages are rundowns of the two playable characters Jill and Chris, where they mostly give you information we discovered while playing it. Jill gets a lockpick, Jill can carry more, Jill is the victim of casual sexism in the middle of her profile for no readily apparent reason, Jill has fewer hit points. It's really after that this whole feature goes off piste for me, because we start an extended play. Rather than being advanced impressions of the game or a discussion of its structure, you know, something that might help you decide whether to look forward to or pre-order the game, it's a player's guide. And a detailed one. In the first paragraph it says, the following route is not only the quickest, but allows your character the chance to conserve ammunition and health by only entering the areas you need to. Fundamentally, Resident Evil is an exploration and discovery game. It's an adventure, a mystery, a horror thriller. And here we are, three full months before you can play it, and the entire first section of this magazine is basically a step-by-step -step guide to the optimum path through it. One designed specifically so you see as little of the game as possible to speedrun it. Is it me, or is that absolutely bloody mad? This new escape room opens in three months, the key's under the mat. Your birthday is in three months, I've got you this Lego. Also I've already built it. Let me tell you about this new film that's out in three months. Here's the full shooting script and a signed photo of the characters that survived. It does present a problem. Because if we deconstruct this entirely, then I'm about to tell you the entire first half of a game I want you to play. The first half of a game I want to play, in fact. So in terms of walkthrough, let's restrict ourselves to the things we've already seen. The walkthrough focuses on Chris, but other than the lack of the chaperone, who it turns out is called Barry, it's going to play out very similar. Although with apparently a lot more drama, because again the author has decided to insert dialogue for Chris. It tells you to go find that first zombie, although as Chris you do have to dispatch it yourself. It also points out that the dead guy is Kenneth from Bravo Team, and he's carrying ammo, so we're going to be going back to yoink that. The guide weirdly describes Jill as shrieking in terror when Barry kills the zomb. Here's a replay of that. Let me take care of this. I think this author might have issues with women. Chris gets his gun from the hall rather than starting with it, which seems a little pointless, but it also is the game's way of introducing you to how it wants you to save with the typewriters. The guide goes on to describe the map puzzle we did as Jill, but continues to insert the author's interpretation of Chris's thoughts into the text. It also tells you to move a box I didn't spot to enter another room. This guide really is going to tell you everything step by step. It even wants you to skip where I encountered the dogs and go straight upstairs. I'm getting out of this now, or I might as well just read the guide and never play the game. I get the author's dilemma. Imagine you're three months from release and someone says, can you write a feature on this exciting new game? You're going to think that's great, and then you ask for the word count and it's the size of a small novel. You'd panic. Narrating everything you do is about all you have left. That's fine if you're a top quality magazine based YouTube series nearly 30 years later, but it's a bit weird three months ahead of the game, so to speak. It gets worse though, because this is the entire rest of the article, and then it says it continues next month. And it does. Sort of. There's a one page article where they answer the most common queries they say they've received from people who bought the Japanese version. That's not what was promised though. The original article clearly implies a direct continuation and I'm wondering if the most common letter they received was more along the lines of, just what the bloody hell do you think you're doing? If there's a reason for this it might be that it's here the whole Maximin experiment broke down. 
Issue 7 was already the last for the magazine, where EMAP claimed in a hastily written note at the back that it was simply being rested over the quiet summer months and would return in autumn. Much like your dad popping out for cigarettes the same year, this was an obvious lie. Apogee, id, 3D Realms, Legends All, and in some combination basically responsible for the emergence of the first person shooter genre. Enter the time machine with me, but no eating, you'll get crumbs all over the seat. Apogee comes first. American Scott Miller founded the company to sell his own games, starting with the roguelike Kingdom of Croz, which also all but invented the concept of shareware. An extended demo would be given away by whatever means was available, and you were encouraged to copy it far and wide. These free episodes were usually much larger than what you consider a demo. By 1989, when the Cross Trilogy was complete, the free version was the entire first episode, with only the two slightly larger sequel episodes being chargeable. This mechanic would come to define Apogee for a very long time afterwards. As for Cross, it generated company starting amounts of money, and funny you should mention that because the Apogee name first appears on the free version of Kingdom distributed with the disc magazine Big Blue Disc from Softdisc. Softdisc was also notable for being the workplace of Tom Hall, Adrian Carmack, John Romero and John Carmack, who were working on a further disc magazine called Gamer's Edge. They used Carmack's smooth scrolling routines to demo a possible PC conversion of Super Mario Bros. 3. Unsurprisingly, Nintendo didn't go for the large-scale commercial opportunities of having four nerds on an obscure American disc mag take control of their biggest property. So plan B was to adopt this work into an original game. Extending the cross-based business relationship, Apogee published the result, Commander Keen in Invasion of the Vorticons, in late 1990. It generated company starting amounts of money. And funny you should mention that, because in February the next year the four amigos founded their own company. This was a decision they apparently made about 0.6 seconds after opening their first royalty checks. The company was called id, as in the Freud model of the psyche, but it's understandable so many get this wrong and call them ID, because they spent the development of Keen referring to themselves as Ideas from the Deep. We need to go elsewhere for the next step, and weirdly, back nine years. It's 1981 and Muse Software released one of the earliest stealth games, taking place during World War II as an allied prisoner of war trying to escape the Nazis. The game was released on the Apple II as Castle Wolfenstein, and it did very well by the standards of the time, selling 50,000 copies or so. Good enough for a sequel at least. Beyond Castle Wolfenstein appeared three years later. One of those 50,000 copies had gone to John Romero. As part of a gentlemanly settlement with Softdisk relating to them developing Keen largely using Softdisk equipment out of hours, they'd agreed to do a series of little games for the disc magazines. They used these to experiment, and one of those experiments was this. April 1991's Hover Tank 3D. I could blind you with science on how this is working on PCs patently not up to the task, but that's more Timberwolf's thing. In short, so-called ray casting can handle simple 3D environments like this, because all it does is cast horizontal rays forward from the player to the first thing they will see, and calculates the maths for that, and only that. This means it's quick but it also means you can't do shadows or reflections and is very much limited to environments that look 3D but actually aren't. Hover Tank, you will notice, is all on a single level, with the ceiling and floor that are basically the absence of any other object as far as the game is concerned. It also gets rapidly slower the further away an object is, so it's really only usable for environments that are conceptually inside. You might have spotted, or know, what's coming next, but there's one more step to get there, Id realised they could implement basic textures on the walls without losing any speed, and the first time we saw that was Catacomb 3D. Apogee saw Catacomb and wanted in. Romero remembered Castle Wolfenstein and essentially suggested remaking it, but in 3D. With the 3D itself being new, they deliberately kept the game mechanics simple in order to not confuse people. You know where we're going. Wolfenstein 3D generally considered the first FPS anyone actually remembers. 
The list of things added to the game engine since Catacomb was revolutionary then, but is almost cute now. Among their number are doors and decorative non-wall objects, which basically means shit on the floor. This is also, apparently at Romero's insistence, where secrets hidden by movable walls enters the genre, and proceeds to plague it for the next 30 years. You know Wolfenstein, of course, it was a phenomenon. It had cost so little to develop that their one fancy development computer represented about a fifth of the budget, and a similar amount is covered by tracking down the remains of the long dead Muse software to buy the rights to the name. The game was released as one episode for free and two to buy, with a further three arriving later that year as a separate purchase. Retail partner Formgen also released a double length prequel episode Spear of Destiny into stores. It was converted to everything that could take it, including a Jaguar port done in three weeks, most of which seems to be removing the censoring from the SNES version it was based on. Sales were brisk. The first royalty check was for about four times the development budget, and as more people discovered it, it kept selling. A couple of years later, it was estimated a million copies of the free first episode were about the place. Not many know Wolfenstein 3D was also the third Wolfenstein game, but they probably do know it was id's only Wolfenstein game. They were already busy on the next thing, a thing they could own outright, and if their name wasn't made with Wolfenstein, then there is surely no one listening to this that doesn't know… Doom. And while this is a story about Doom, this is absolutely not a story about Doom. For our purposes, the only interesting part of Doom here is what's missing from the credits screen. You see, Wolfenstein had generated publishing company starting amounts of money, and funny you should mention that because it had done exactly that. Doom was self-published, and the game engine entirely self-owned. But this leaves Apogee with a problem. Their best developer just buggered off with the good game engine, and was clearly about to hit it huge. They did have time to prepare their own first-person shooter rival to Doom, which would debut in almost impertinent fashion just one week before id's game. Surely the wind would be taken out of id's sails and everyone today will be playing Apogee's game and Doom will be long forgotten. Right. I haven't even shown you it yet and you already know the punchline here. Apogee had contracted Jam Productions, who were affiliated to their mates at Softdisk. But all Jam had was the Wolfenstein 3D engine, which of course they didn't write. I won't sugarcoat it, Apogee's great hope against their former colleagues, released a mere 168 hours before the absolutely iconic and seminal Doom, looks like this. I'm being cruel for narrative purposes, because there's nothing wrong with Blake Stone as a game. Yeah, the engine is a mildly warmed over version of Wolf's, but let's not forget that Wolf is really bloody good. And while this is not the game we're here to litigate, Blake seems to broadly carry that over. And now the final name, 3D Realms. Apogee decided in 1994 to create a new label for every genre of game they published. They started with 3D Realms and the game Terminal Velocity, and basically finished there. Other than a short-lived pinball imprint, that was all of them. And in 1996, they gave up and changed the company name to 3D Realms instead. And they needed a big advance in technology, and a new 3D game with an engine and character they could own. Luckily, they already had both. Between the two idpent Commander Keen trilogies, with a little bit of assistance, Apogee had produced a couple of their own platformers, starring a character called Duke Nukem. Duke would become an arrogant action hero parody of a character. But in these first incarnations, he's just supposed to be a man annoyed by the evil Megalord who has interrupted broadcast of his favourite soap. No, really. They're good games, very similar to the Keen ones, but the world probably wouldn't have missed them any more than it misses more games starring Jill of the Jungle or Jazz Jackrabbit if it had ended there. A replacement for the pensionable Wolfenstein engine was already available. Build had been around for a year already, 
The primary developer was Ken Silverman, who in another universe is at least as famous as any of the id guys. He'd just finished his own first person game, Ken's Labyrinth, for Epic Mega Games, when 3D Realms contracted him to build. Build. Weirdly, 3D Realms weren't the first to use it in a game. Or the second. Or even the third, really, if you count an early version being yoinked for a game only released in Taiwan and South Korea. More legally, Capstone Software used it for fantasy shooter Witchhaven, and really needs more explanation than we're going to even attempt here, William Shatner's Tech War. The only fact I'll offer you about it is Maximum gave it 3 out of 5. So just a mere two years late, 3D Realms were ready to reclaim their crown, and for the second time we have the third game in a series getting called 3D. The plot is, Duke Nukem gets shot down on his way back from Duke Nukem 2 by aliens who have also invaded. Luckily, he used his time on the ship productively in order to turn himself into a complete stereotype. And even more luckily, he appears to have crashed into the red light district. Duke really wants to be Doom. The screen furniture is Doom, the graphical style is surprisingly Doom, and so are the controls. I've edited them to make stray for things someone with fewer than seven arms can actually pull off, and it does help. Duke's engine does have some advances over Doom. The ability to hinge one plane of a roof allows for slightly better environments, for instance, and it understands height better. This is kinda irrelevant to the player though, as just like Dogs and Doom, you can't look up or down, which makes some fights just hilariously immersion breaking as you shoot horizontally at a guy 30 feet above you. Tonally, Duke lives exactly where it was released, in 1996, and we're at another one of those yesterzine times where it looks like I planned things. As the magazines themselves were looking to the lad's culture in an effort to move with the times, so does this game. Duke Nukem was built for the horny teenager of appropriate sexual preference, and glory is in it. You turn on the projector at the cinema, and you immediately realise what kind of theatre it is, for instance, with the best video quality they were probably capable of at the time. Later, you're going to run into an adult bookstore, and some incredibly bored sex workers too, all of which is played with the emotional maturity you've come to expect. You'd forgive it if the game held up, but as someone coming back to this for the first time in a quarter of a century, it really does not. Even on easy, it glories in decimating your health at every turn. Unavoidable surprise explosions will reduce your health, enemies which are indistinct at best in this resolution will surprise you, and always get shots in, and the controls are not up to the task. I know people remember this game fondly, and to be fair I've not tried any later source ports or anything here, this is pure original retail release, but after getting surprise blown up coming down a lift in level 2, I meh quit the thing. It's an action hero shooter, but Duke appears to have been constructed entirely out of damp tissue paper. It's meant to evoke being in an action movie, but it doles out ammo like those really weird one piece at a time paper machines you get in public toilets. It's not like the world is short of FPS. Quake was just over the horizon. Doom and Apogee's own Rise of the Triad existed, Rise arguably doing a lot of the same stuff better. And yet anything I don't like about Duke was about to get worse. Duke 3D was successful. Very successful in fact. They sold over 3 million copies of a game that cost well less than half a million to develop. So it's not surprising they announced a sequel the next year for release in 1998. To save time, they contacted their old friends at id, and agreed to use the engine from Quake 2. Then, they junked that and switched to Epic's Unreal Engine. Then again to a newer version of Unreal Engine. In 2000, an insider called it a series of chaotic tech demos. Nonetheless, they had enough to sell the publishing rights to Take 2, who were hoping to release it in 2001. Instead, Wired gave it the 2001 Vaporware of the Year award. It did not release in 2001, or 2002, or 2003, or 2004. It became a running internet joke despite several offers from other developers to take over. In 2009, Take-Two pulled the plug, stepped in and handed the game to Borderlands developer Gearbox, who quickly found they'd been handed a turd which had been spray painted with 10 other worse turds. 
they at least as some sort of professional developer managed to release a game, a mere 14 years after its announcement. But the game was even worse than calling the collector's edition Duke's Big Package was. If most of Duke Nukem was a bit cringeworthy in 1996, by 2011 it felt like a relic from another universe, and Metacritic ratings hovering around 50 were both deserved and pretty much the end for the character as a commercial force. Other than an appearance in a special edition of Gearbox's own seminal Bulletstorm, he's not really been seen since. On the back page is Knight of the Realm Sir Richard Pitchard, a man who can fit more scripts and certainly more jokes into six minutes than some other worse channels can into over 30. Wait. Shit. It takes a special man to get away with some of the jokes in a Pitchard video, being as they are in need of a content warning button the size of a small barn. Irritatingly, he's so lovely you don't question it for a moment as he names his questing party after the contents of an album called Now That's What I Call You Tree. Now I think about it, he might have been the one man who could have made Duke Nukem Forever funny. If you follow along with this channel, you may remember last year's playlist of crap PS2 games, where Pitchard took on Little Britain, and while I wouldn't ever tell him this, beat the whole damn lot of us. First up is Vicky Pollard. She's a chav who's overbred, that's a joke. But more recently, he's been highlighting those unknown games, those forgotten games, those tiny footnotes in gaming history. Like this, an obscure little visual novel called Heavy Rain. There it is. No, not the car. No, no, no! Oh my god, he lost the balloon! That cost two dollars, no! So go subscribe to Sir Rich. Despite the name, we promise he's not a Tory. And come back here last Friday in August, because there's a huge anniversary to celebrate. Goodbye.